Okay, uh, this being our, our final uh, session, uh, we have to do both uh, some, some cleanup and some wrap up. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start, um, and then uh, Professor Unger uh, will, um, will continue, and then uh, we'll interact in our usual way. Um, the, the, the challenges that um, we um, have been concerned with in this course uh, can be summarized um, from my perspective under uh, three headings. Uh, one is the, the, the challenge of uh, economic growth, um, and that challenge is being um, uh, evidenced in the developed world, in the advanced economies, um, uh, by the evidence that uh, overall productivity growth, total factor, total factor productivity growth, um, has slowed down significantly. Uh, in the developing world, uh, it is being uh, brought to the fore by the fact that the, um, uh, um, in, in the low and middle income countries, there's a process of premature industrialization uh, that has taken place that, that's really uh, cutting off uh, or, or significantly slowing down this, uh, this process of convergence uh, through the, the traditional method of, uh, of industrialization. Uh, um, so these are um, aspects of the, of the growth challenge. There is an inclusion challenge um, that's created by uh, a, a number of uh, things, but here we've, we've emphasized the, the role of, of technology, um, how um, the uh, prevailing technologies and, 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 and uh, the, the new technological possibilities have remained relatively narrowly focused on a small sliver uh, of economies, uh, both in the uh, advanced and the uh, developing world. Um, and, and there's a political challenge um, uh, uh, of, of how do we maintain, uh, again, in my terms, I think uh, Roberta would put it somewhat differently, but in my terms, how do we maintain or, or uh, establish uh, um, pluralist uh, democracies, democracies that are, that are functioning well. Uh, I, I think what unites these three challenges uh, from the perspective of, of, of this course, I would say, uh, is, um, is the relative absence or scarcity uh, of, uh, of, of good jobs. Uh, there's jo jobs that are uh, productive, they pay well, and provide for um, uh, um, what would normally be considered middle or upper, upper middle income uh, standard of living. Uh, so from the perspective, so this is, part of the growth challenge because uh, the problem is that uh, new technologies, new pro where productive um, uh, uh, employment tends to be limited to a relatively narrow part of the labor force. So it shows up uh, in terms of you know, lack of access to good jobs. Uh, it shows up, of course, in inclusion uh, because uh, it's lack of inclusion. Uh, um, what it really means is that people don't have access, access to good jobs. And there's a political challenge, of course, what we've seen, the, 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 uh, the, 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 what, what's called the populist backlash or the right-wing autocratic backlash uh, often has a, as a social basis uh, a kind of, of, of um, uh, um, uh, reaction uh, to the disappearance of uh, sort of middle-class uh, type jobs, uh, either through the industrialization uh, or the process of creating of, of a large number of uh, informal uh, or low productivity service sector jobs uh, in, in most economies. Um, at the end of my remarks, I'm going to argue that, that an important part of, of the solution to this uh, is going to be uh, a kind of a new social contract that takes the form of uh, uh, a new industrial policy where uh, industrial in quotation marks because it's not meant to apply only to manufacturing and only to in industries, uh, but it's sort of uh, in the spirit of an industrial policy where uh, creating a partnership between various uh, government agencies and various segments of society, including most importantly uh, private sector firms, uh, um, towards the objective of uh, creating more, more good jobs. That's going to require a strength, a state uh, that's uh, strong enough in terms of uh, pursuing an agenda and a vision of inclusive growth, uh, but of course a state that's not so strong uh, that it can, can smother uh, pluralism and, and, and becomes autocratic and, and repressive. So that's sort of broadly 
where we started and uh, where uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to end uh, today. Uh, so I want to um, start actually uh, these re remarks by uh, picking up a little bit on a discussion that, that we had over a relatively short period of time uh, earlier in the course in terms of the role of economics. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I understand from a useful uh, economics. That's going to be partly a critique, uh, to, uh, partly a response to Professor Unger's critique, uh, partly a reflection on what the relationship be between this kind of economics and, and, and neoliberalism is. I want to talk a little bit uh, about um, sort of uh, globalization and how that fits in. And then finally, um, uh, concluding uh, with this idea of uh, the uh, the new uh, productivist uh, uh, collaborative industrial policy, which I call the, the new uh, social contract. Um, Professor Unger made uh, four uh, points in his critique of contemporary uh, economics, um, radical separation of analysis from empirics, a deficit of institutional imagination, uh, lack of a proper view of production, and lack of an account of the diversity of material on which competitive selection operates uh, in the economic domain. Uh, I'm going to be focusing here briefly on just the first two of those critiques. Um, I think the last two are, will, will take me in a, in a sort of much more uh, technical direction, but uh, um, uh, let me just say a few words just on the first two. Um, as I had already said, um, when uh, Roberto laid out this critique, uh, I will mostly, uh, I will see uh, considerable ground on the, on, on the issue of the uh, deficit of institutional imagination, uh, but I will argue that that's not as big a deal. Um, uh, on the uh, alleged separation of analysis from empirics, um, I still, after several years of rehashing this argument, uh, I still don't quite see the force of that argument and I'm going to argue against it. Okay, um, so I, I've mentioned this quote <coughs> in the past, but I think it's probably you know, the, the most succinct statement uh, of um, how economics works uh, as a discipline. So it's um, something that John Maynard Keynes said in a letter, I think to Roy Harris, uh, back in 1938. And he described economics as the science of thinking in terms of models, joined to the art of choosing models which are relevant. And there are two parts to that statement. One is there's a science of thinking in terms of models. What are models? Models are abstractions uh, uh, of reality, simplified abstractions um, that are meant to uh, um, uh, lay uh, sort of bare uh, the workings of a particular uh, causal argument. So they are, uh, because they're abstractions, they're models, uh, they are no um, uh, they're, they're, they're decidedly not meant to be realistic or a reflection of the actual world. Uh, so their relation to the real world is the same as the relation that a subway map uh, or a bike trail map uh, has to the actual geographical uh, landscape. Um, and uh, it's useful because without um, a subway map or without the bike map, uh, uh, you wouldn't be able to find your way. Uh, the, assuming you're, you're traveling by that mode of transportation, uh, but there's certainly not uh, an actual description of the geographical landscape uh, in any realistic fashion. Uh, the second um, uh, component of the, dis this, the, the, um, the definition is that uh, this uh, science of using models is joined to uh, uh, art of picking, or increasingly I would say there are scientific elements to that too, which is choosing models, uh, which are choosing the models that are relevant. Um, so again, continuing with the analogy of the maps, um, uh, the issue here is, you know, whether you're going to be using a highway map or a subway map or a bike map, uh, um, depending on the mode of transportation you're using. So if you're using a bike and you take a subway map with you, it's not going to be very useful. It's going to lead you astray, um, and that's the same way in which, you know, if you, uh, you know use the map of a classical economy uh, when the economy demands Keynesian remedies, you're going to make exactly the same kind of, 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 of mistake. Um, so uh, the usefulness of these models, the maps, uh, depends on being able to pick the right map or the right model. 
uh, picking the uh, bike map uh, when you're traveling by bike, using the subway map when you're taking the underground, and, and so on. Uh, but why use these abstractions in the first place? Why uh, simplify, make things abstract? Uh, that's because uh, that's the only way you can actually think. Uh, analysis depends on abstraction, uh, and therefore uh, you better be very upfront and clear about the specific abstraction that you're using, and that's what models do. Um, and uh, is a wonderful uh, little uh, story by Borges um, uh, that uh, actually makes that point. This is the entire short story in, the, in this one paragraph. Uh, talks about a sort of a, a faraway land where the map makers, the cartographers, uh, um, became so enamored of perfection uh, that they would um, create these detailed maps. Uh, so originally, uh, the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city, the map of the empire, uh, the, the, um, the, the entirety of a province. And that wasn't enough. In time, what they decided to do was to actually, uh, you know, you know, uh, design maps of the empire whose size was that of the empire, and which coincided, coincided point for point to it. So one-to-one -one maps, because that the art of perfection, after all, required that they be as close to the original as possible. Uh, but of course, as the story ends, uh, later generations are to find these maps discarded uh, in the in the desert because they were completely useless. Um, being so close to the reality, uh, they were completely impractical and, and they couldn't use it. So this, in brief, is the argument for abstraction. And anyone who tells you that they're not simplifying, they're not abstracting, they're not using theories, they're not using models, is simply using bad models or improperly or incompletely specified models. And that's what I think is the, um, uh, is the advantage uh, that uh, econo the economics way of thinking brings to discussions uh, about being as, as very clear about exactly what assumptions are being made, which, am, which assumptions among those are critical assumptions in the sense that they are critical to the result, and exactly uh, what causal channels um, uh, produce the, uh, the result, uh, result in question. Um, and when economics works well, uh, it does things like this, uh, where you have two Harvard econ uh, economists, uh, Robert Barrow and Jason Furman, from practically uh, the um, sort of diametrically opposite viewpoints on the political spectrum, uh, but producing a paper together uh, where they are analyzing uh, the macroeconomic effects of Trump's 2017 tax reform. Uh, they do not agree in the end, uh, but they are clear on what it is that they don't agree with. They agree on a lot of it because the framework, the models that they use, uh, enables them to reach agreement on certain aspects, but those models uh, also clarify exactly where their disagreements are. Uh, and those models help them state in the paper exactly what aspects of the model, what workings, or in model speak, what parameters they disagree about. Um, and that's helpful because sort of another useful um, uh, 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 aspect of thinking uh, as an economist and thinking with these models uh, is that precisely even when uh, there is no convergence of views, uh, there is convergence on why there is no convergence. That is, on what aspects, on what part of the working of the model, what parameter, uh, there is uncertainty and lack of convergence. Okay? Um, that's one model. That's one area. Um, there are uh, uh, many other areas where uh, thinking judiciously in terms of models and alternative models or a variety of models advances our conversation on the effects of, of policy and public policy. Uh, another very important area is the discussion that has been taking place in the economics literature over the last two, two decades or so on the uh, consequences of minimum wages. The question is what is the effect of a wage floor imposed by the government on employment. If you only take Econ 101 or here Act 10, you're likely to see or likely to have seen until very recently that price controls have problems. In this particular day, a wage floor uh, 
uh, is likely to reduce demand for employment. Okay? Uh, but in subsequent courses, and now uh, I can tell you uh, pretty uh, confidently that in subsequent, subsequent versions of X10, uh, you would see that the answer uh, is that uh, actually the answer is it depends. It depends on what model of the economy we have in the back of our minds. It is true that in a model of competitive equilibrium, where uh, the supply of labor uh, comes from a wide variety of employers behaving in a competitive uh, way, uh, that in fact a minimum wage would force employment level down. Because as the cost of labor rose, uh, employers would reduce demand for workers, the total employment level would fall. However, uh, in a model, in an alternative model, where in fact there isn't that much competition, either because workers are differentiated or employers have highly differentiated um, uh, demands for, for the kinds of workers that they want, or because labor markets may not be very integrated and uh, labor mobility across different sub-markets of sub-labor markets may not may be limited. It could be that in that market, in fact, employers feel that they're not perfectly competitive. In other words, they have some control over the wage that they might play, they might pay. And in that model, in fact, uh, as long as the uh, minimum wage is not too high, uh, putting a floor on uh, wages will, in fact, increase the demand for employment. Employment demand will increase. The simple logic of this is putting a, a floor converts firms that had some market power into effectively perfectly competitive because they no longer have any control at the low end of the labor market uh, about the wage that they can uh, um, uh, charge. They can charge only that minimum wage and facing a fixed wage, uh, then they, pr they effectively uh, produce behavior that's analogous to the behavior of competitive um, uh, uh, firm. So the general answer is it depends, but more than that, uh, uh, what every model does, it also tells you what it depends on. Uh, so the value of these models is not just to generate agnosticism or uncertainty about the effects of policy, but it asks you just to, to tell you uh, what that, where that uncertainty comes from. Uh, what's, what is it that it depends on? Um, and in this particular context, uh, what it tells you is that the effect of um, the minimum wage on employment is going to depend on precisely how much competition there is in the labor market. Uh, and, and, and with that guide, then you can go and actually figure out uh, whether the actual workings of the labor market looks more like the competitive one or looks more like the monopsonistic one. And then you can dig deeper and, uh, and, 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 and the models will tell you exactly the kinds of things that, that you want to, to look at. Uh, this is not just a sort of hypothetical process of how economics works. This is how ex actually the economics has worked. And that uh, as evidence has accumulated, um, uh, many labor economists' priors about sort of how labor markets work has moved from the competitive market model to the monopsonistic market model. Okay? So empirical analysis becomes very uh, uh, important. This, what Keynes, this, Keynes termed this art of picking the model that's relevant. Uh, but that's why um, I sort of uh, objected a little bit to the term art because there's a lot of science there in terms of using uh, um, rigorous methods of empirical analysis to discriminate uh, as to when one or the other model is, is, uh, uh, is, is relevant. Um, so this is kind of a, you know, um, in this kind of an area, um, uh, there is a very clear argument about sort of the, 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 you know, how causality works, what the causation is. Causation goes from precisely in terms of how firms operate. Firms operate by trying to maximize their profits and they make their employment and wage decisions on the basis of that. There's a very clear causal cha cha chain of analysis. And it's, it's not ad hoc because we're not changing our assumptions about how firms work, saying that they you know, profit maximize here but they don't profit maximize there. Uh, the change is actually external to the firms themselves about the, the structure of the market. Uh, and the logic itself is not imported from the outside. It's, it's endogenous to the economic model. Um, so I think this is at its best is how um, economics works. Um, I think you can uh, uh, extend the range 
of uh, uh, explanations or causal theories or causal models um, that is used in, in, in economics. I'm uh, just here listed a, a large no a four different areas where there are significant models uh, on economic development, on growth, on the size of the government, on aggregate employment. Uh, I'm not going to go through these. Um, I'll just we'll leave it on your slide for you uh, to look at uh, later on. Um, what economics has become, uh, and in here I think we agree uh, with, with uh, uh, Professor Unger, uh, that it has, uh, it, it's, it's no longer um, a domain where you can expect uh, a programmatic vision. Uh, it's become more of a uh, sort of a professional discipline. Uh, think about it as you know, a sort of dentistry uh, or plumbing. Um, than uh, sort of a, a where you know you expect you know you don't you don't expect your plumber uh, to have a you know sort of you know good architectural vision um, when you know economics is uh, works well uh, that's exactly uh, um, you know what the economist does um, the so what the, the what the the benefit has been. Uh, as in my example suggests, the benefit has been uh, that economics has been able to provide much greater precision uh, um, and possible contribution uh, in the service uh, of, of a vision. So it's not that the discipline or the precision that the discipline provides uh, precludes a vision. It becomes a helpful to the vision or it can be instrument for the uh, vision. Uh, the con, the downside, uh, uh, and here I think um, uh, Professor Unger is ba was basically right when he says that uh, economics has become in some ways a branch of logic because that sort of thinking in terms of models is really being sort of uh, articulating very clearly exactly what different causal arguments are and what they depend on. Uh, that's in some ways a branch of logic. Uh, except that there is an empirical uh, uh, and significantly uh, I important empirical layer to it uh, in, a, in, a, in addition. Um, so this doesn't mean that, uh, that individual economists can view themselves as social reformers and can't have their own visions. Uh, but uh, it's, it, the, the vision comes from outside economics. It's not necessarily provided from within the economics. So in this sort of individual economists who view themselves as uh, propounding a vision, uh, often present that vision as if uh, it comes from within economics, but it's usually something within economics uh, compounded by, uh, 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 expanded by something from outside economics. So if you're a Chicago School libertarian, think about Milton Friedman, uh, then essentially uh, the, your thinking is based on certain elements of economics as a discipline, but then you, you add to that certain normative judgments on inequality and certain normative views about the role of the government. Uh, and that's why where you get the you know, libertarian uh, viewpoint or the, 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 the neoliberal viewpoint. If you're a sort of left of center Krugman type liberal, uh, again, some of it is based on uh, uh, thinking about you know, economics as a discipline, but you have to add to that certain normative judgments on inequality. Um, certain uh, uh, views about how the government might operate. Those again come largely from outside uh, economics. Okay. Um, so this, the, the flip side of this is that it is uh, not correct to associate uh, various <coughs> ideological visions or programmatic visions that have used some of this economic architecture um, to associate those vis visions uh, with the economics uh, directly itself. So that means that the neoliberal uh, or the market fundamentalist uh, agenda uh, cannot be deduced uh, purely from the economics that goes into it. Um, and therefore, uh, the you know, it's economics as a discipline is really only partly complicit in it, uh, and the, the same you might have said about the sort of 1960s, 1970s sort of 
you know, welfare state liberals, uh, which sort of you know, took, uh, um, based their views on, 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 on Keynesian ideas, once again, I think that vision uh, was only partly uh, derived from economics uh, proper, uh, even though it certainly used economics in it. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean, again, to repeat myself, that these tools are not going to have a useful role to play in the service of, in the service of those programs. Um, now, where I don't think there is a huge loss involved, because economics as a discipline uh, does not, or is, is, is not built to develop a programmatic uh, vision, uh, is that I just, I just don't think that this is necessarily uh, the job of just economists, or that, that e economics uh, or economists have any particular expertise or particular comparative advantage uh, in developing uh, those visions. And I think generating those visions in some ways are, uh, is a task for, for, for all of us and not members of a particular profession or a particular discipline, okay? Um, even though um, I sound like I might be uh, defending uh, economics. Um, I have a long list of complaints uh, about uh, economics as practice. I'm just going to not, not going to spend a whole time, a lot of time here, uh, but I just want to make clear uh, that, um, that uh, I, I think there are a number of ways in which um, uh, economics has, has failed in, in the past. I think one of the key mistakes uh, is um, sort of not understanding this key point about uh, about models, that you can mistake a model for reality and then take it too literally. Um, and also you can uh, forget that there are multiple models. There's in fact diversity of models. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's, it's not the model, it's just a model. Um, okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll skip uh, some of these other points here. We can come back uh, uh, to them perhaps later. Okay, so uh, just a few final words uh, on, on economics. Uh, I think one of the you know, uh, biggest divides that's sort of hard to communicate is really the divide here between what I call the economics of the seminar room uh, from the economics of the policy discussion. That the economics of policy discussion usually tends to get captured uh, by a particular interest, gets to be hijacked by a particular interest. So for example, that's why so in a lot of discussion about neoliberalism presumes that neoliberalism derives from economics when it doesn't. Uh, I think you know, to the extent that the economics profession uh, wasn't clear enough about that, I think the profession uh, uh, is partly at fault, uh, uh, but uh, it is uh, the, the, the discussion in the seminar room um, doesn't have any relationship to the kinds of policy prescription that uh, neoliberalism typically promotes. Um, okay. So uh, let me just say uh, a, a couple of things uh, about uh, uh, globalization. Uh, we've referred to some of these issues in the past. It has not been central to, to our discussion, but I just want to um, uh, make a couple of points uh, on globalization. Uh, first, sort of the, on the question of the tension between uh, democracy and, and globalization. And I want to make sure that uh, I, I, I make the point that when there is a tension, uh, that this tension arises uh, not necessarily because uh, global rules or global markets constrain the ability of national governments to do what they want, that the, those rules constrain domestic policy space, uh, and that therefore they might also reduce the scope for institutional diversity. I think those constraints that reduce the ability of executives to do what they want uh, do not in themselves uh, undermine democracy per se. Uh, that's because democracies sometimes willingly uh, enter into agreements uh, to constrain what executives or parliaments can do in the service of democracy. Uh, so uh, when a executive or a parliament delegates, let's say, monetary uh, policy to an independent central bank, uh, it does so because it realizes that day-to-day monetary, -day monetary policy making by 450 congressmen is likely to be much more injurious and, and damaging to price stability uh, 
than delegating it to an independent body which only cares about price stability in the long term. And therefore, that delegation of monetary policy uh, 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 is in fact a delegation or a constraint on what the executive or the parliament can do or the legislature can do that actually enhances the functioning of democracy and doesn't undermine democracy. So this is in political science, this is called the principle of democratic delegation, that the delegating powers that you have uh, to another um, body, thereby tying your hands in what you can do, uh, but doing so in a way to, to enhance the performance of, of, of democracy. And in fact, global rules or global agreements uh, can enhance uh, democracy through a number of different channels. So um, uh, it's possible that trade agreements, for example, written in the right way, uh, can limit the power of special interest lobbies to get what they want uh, at the national level and therefore in enhance the performance uh, of democracies at the national level. International agreements can protect minority rights. International agreements, uh, by forcing deliberation, uh, by forcing the requirement that rules be uh, based in science, for example, uh, um, can enhance the quality of democratic deliberation. But just because global rules can enhance democracy doesn't mean that they always will do so, or that they need to do so. So the big issue here uh, is to make a distinction uh, between external constraints or the constraints that globalization and trade agreements or financial globalization or global economic norms uh, on what governments can and cannot do uh, to diminish uh, the distinguished cases where such rules or norms are designed to address uh, genuine failings of democratic polities. Uh, for example, the time commitment, the, the, the time inconsistency problem of monetary policy, the lack of transparency, special interest capture, as opposed to global rules that actually aggravate democratic malfunction by privileging, by enhancing the powers of special interests. And I think much of the, the, the um, uh, much of the uh, uh, um, the criticism of the form that globalization has taken place after the 1990s, uh, um, the part that, that, that really uh, resonates is the part that says the problem isn't that globalization necessarily has um, limited policy space, but that the global rules that have been enacted after the 1990s have been, the, have been set there uh, by uh, special interests, by lobbies, by large corporations like Big Pharma, by big banks, to establish rules such as you know, uh, capital mobility or uh, in trade related intellectual property rights or investor, um, uh, investor state dispute settlement uh, arbitration procedures, which are effectively rules that are first order redistributional, that are rules that are meant to uh, increase the relative ability of those groups uh, to, um, to increase their incomes while essentially uh, having an end run behind the uh, existing domestic institutions, whether they are labor standards or whether they are domestic uh, 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 regulatory uh, structures and so forth. So I think you know, sort of when we think about uh, sort of the compatibility of economic openness and globalization with democracy, I think the question we ought to be asking is whether uh, you know, the rules that lie behind a particular model of globalization are rules uh, that are uh, fundamentally um, furthering the interests of, of certain groups at the expense of others? Or are they rules that are really addressing uh, failings of democracy? Is there, in other words, they are rules that enhance democratic functioning uh, rather than undermine it. So uh, I would say that from that perspective, the way that I would think about uh, what a, uh, a, a new system of, of globalization would look like is, um, is through um, some, I believe, six principles uh, that, that I would articulate. One is the recognition that just like markets are in self-standing, that global markets or globalization uh, isn't uh, self-standing and therefore there's always a system of governance uh, um, uh, uh, in the functioning of, of the markets. Uh, second, a recognition that uh, for now and perhaps for the foreseeable future uh, that those mechanisms of governance and the political communities uh, that produce that governance uh, 
are today organized largely around nation states, um, and, and that's kind of a, 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 a reality. Now, one might generate a normative um, uh, justification for the presence of the nation state by arguing that a certain amount of diversity in institutional arrangements, a uh, certain amount of experimentation in institutional arrangements is desirable in and of itself, and therefore that a world uh, which is made up, <coughs> which is constituted uh, of diverse uh, political communities is desirable on, on account of that diversity and experimentation, or we might simply take it as an empirical reality that that's what we have anyhow. Okay? The only difference between those empirical acknowledgement and a normative commitment is that that normative, the commitment doesn't necessarily deliver you uh, the exact distribution of the world into the existing political space that we have right now. It simply uh, says that um, that we have um, uh, that that you know a kind of a, 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 a you know sort of a, a homogeneous, homogenization of institutions and governance is not desirable. Um, third, um, a related idea uh, that um, and, and, and very much sort of you know, dear uh, to our discussion here uh, that there is not a single way. Uh, to prosperity, that there is, you know, that institution, that institutional experimentation means uh, that will there will be uh, uh, divergence uh, in institutional arrangements and governments, governance mechanisms, and further that in order to ensure that there can be experimentation and institutional diversity, uh, that we might allow countries or nation states uh, to protect their own social arrangements, uh, regulations, and institutions. And that what that means is that they are, can uphold national standards uh, and can do so if needed by regulating cross-border flows uh, when trade or financial flows uh, demonstrably threaten uh, those institutional practices. Um, the flip side of that uh, is that when countries engage uh, in restricting flows of, of trade and finance, uh, it should be to protect their own, the integrity of their own uh, economic and social arrangements, uh, not to impose those arrangements on others. Okay? Um, so it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a different view. And from that perspective then, if you ask the question, what does global, what do international or multilateral institutions like the IMF or the World Trade Organization do? What they do is they try to lay down the traffic rules. They try to lay down the interface uh, that sort of these different national institutions, when they interact with each other, um, uh, um, how they interact with each other, uh, to create the maximum policy space that's compatible uh, with uh, adverse, with minimizing adverse spillovers from one country's practices uh, onto others. And in principle, such tra traffic rules would leave enough policy space. Uh, to allow advanced nations to redesign their social contracts uh, while also allowing poor nations to position and restructure themselves, their economies, so they, can, they could benefit better for, from, from, uh, from, from globalization. Okay. All right, so uh, in the last part of, of my, my comments, uh, let me uh, get a little bit into the details of what that new social contract uh, might um, uh, might look like. Um, here, uh, it is, uh, I think, these arguments will apply to advanced and developing countries alike, although some of the details will necessarily um, uh, differ. Uh, if we go back to, I think, maybe it was the first or second lecture, uh, I, I, I showed you a little uh, picture like this, uh, which sort of summarizes um, how the economy works, how it produces income and wealth, and how that is distributed to, dis to distinguish among different stages of uh, production. There is pre-production, uh, where uh, workers, investors, entrepreneurs, uh, business people come into the market uh, with their endowments. Those endowments are their, their skills, uh, their capital, their networks, um, and uh, then there is the um, uh, production stage, um, or the, the stage at which 
in a, in investment, innovation, production, exchange actually takes place. That's sort of um, uh, the production stage. And that generates uh, the market outcomes that we observe. Uh, those are the uh, wages, the salaries, the profits, our rents are generated. And that ultimately gives us uh, both aggregate income and wealth in society, as well as uh, a picture of its distribution. Okay? Uh, a lot of policy discussion focuses on um, post-production remedies to inequality, that is redistributing income uh, through the taxation system, or the, through transfers, uh, after the market has uh, generated its results. Uh, some of it focuses on pre-production. Uh, those are, have to do with the endowments that individuals bring to the market before production uh, and exchange takes place. Those might be things like uh, efforts to improve educational outcomes, the uh, uh, universal uh, basic income, or uh, providing individuals with minimum capital endowments, okay? or providing everybody a share. Uh, in the robots, right? Those are all sort of uh, uh, changing the endowments with which people come into. Uh, I think where we need the social contract uh, is in the production stage. Uh, and that's where, in fact, the stage at which uh, wealth is being created um, and it's being redistributed. And, and the kind of industrial policies I'm going to, be, you know, I, I'm going to briefly sketch out um, have to do uh, with, with um, a range of uh, arrangements that deal uh, specifically with the stage at which production takes place, not the pre-production stage and not the post-production stage. Okay? So that means we need to, um, in line with uh, our discussion with, with Michael Lynn uh, last week, uh, this will be um, a, a, a way of thinking about how production takes place uh, that um, moves away from two traditional approaches, one on the one hand of leaving things completely to market, uh, and the other uh, of a kind of a, a, a classic or East Asian type industrial policy uh, that takes the form of pre-designated uh, sectoral priorities and pre-designated policy instruments. Um, so the, the classic uh, South Korean industrial policy was we're going to provide credit subsidies to these five sectors. Um, and that was your industrial policy. Okay? So instead, uh, uh, what I think we need to think about uh, is uh, in light of the, again, using um, uh, Charles Sable's terminology, in light of the provisionality of any conclusion you can draw in terms of um, which sectors, which activities, through what instruments, and through what ends, given the provisional nature of the answers to these questions, uh, given the range and multidimensional nature of the uncertainty that's involved here, um, I think industrial policy has to take a rather different form, uh, which is much more a process rather than a pre-designated um, list of uh, um, sectoral priorities and incentives. Um, so that process is designed to generate uh, a number of byproducts. Uh, one is learning, uh, that is the process of engagement uh, between various agencies of the state. This could be at the very top level federal, it could be at the very bottom level, a local uh, employment office. Uh, they generate this process of interaction and collaboration is designed to generate learning, that is, what are the constraints that are within, being faced? What's feasible? What's not feasible? Um, they're meant to generate experimentation. Um, what works and what doesn't work? What types of interventions? What kinds of collaboration? Um, uh, again, uh, in Sable's terms, uh, ensuring sufficient coordination among the relevant actors, uh, that is, um, bringing all the relevant firms and relevant government agencies around the table and bring them on board. A process of monitoring and evaluation, asking the question, how well are we doing? And a process of continuous uh, revising in return to that, that monitoring. Uh, that is incorporating the new learning, incorporating the new practices uh, into uh, the new 
uh, next generation of policies. So in this type of strategy, strategic collaboration, uh, government's relationship to firms is in between uh, the sort of the two extremes of government either being completely captured by firms or being completely arm's length. There's the, in the market relationship, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the relationship of the, of the uh, government to the firms is arm's length. We just, the government sets the rules and the firms go and do what they want. Uh, there's no other relationship otherwise. In the traditional misguided industrial policy, when, go when other governments, other nations have tried to replicate uh, East Asian style industrial policy, it's been a model of capture. That is government that's trying to do the East Asian model gets captured uh, by the firms and rather than um, uh, being a full-fledged partner in this strategic uh, uh, learning exercise, they become rent-seeking tools for the firms. Okay? Um, so this is uh, something um, that is in between. Um, there is a clear set of responsibilities that is um, applied or imposed on firms. Um, and that is that firms have to engage, have to develop plans of action that are going to be in line with public objectives. And here's, I think, is a big difference from uh, the standard ways in which uh, firms view their themselves, that they view themselves, especially in a hyper-globalized world, is acting on this sort of, you know, uh, you know, this global network of production where they actually don't have any responsibilities necessarily towards their local economies or their local communities, their local input providers, their local suppliers, their local uh, workers. Uh, I think this situation is no longer tenable and I think many businesses are uh, understand, beginning to understand that, that it is not uh, tenable uh, because uh, the kind of, 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 of inclusive um, uh, markets on which a market system relies, kind of, kind of, 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 of buying that the market system requires, um, has, uh, is, 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 uh, is not being generated uh, under our present uh, systems. Um, but this is not a system necessarily that is going to be uh, where firms are, are being, would be penalized for not assuming some of these obligations. Uh, you know, a, a, a key idea about the partnership and the strategic collaboration here is that as a public input provider, as a public goods provider, uh, government entities, government agencies are also delivering services uh, to um, the firms. And those would be uh, infrastructure, uh, appropriate regulation, skills training. In all of these ways, uh, these firms are also recipients of government uh, services and public inputs, and that's why it's a quid, quid pro quo. It's a two-way street uh, rather than simply imposing one-sided uh, regulations. Okay? Um, so there are a number of different forms uh, that, uh, that such collaboration might take and concretely. Um, just for illustrative purposes, it might be to, to promote backward in integration of modern productive firms, back backward in, in integration here meaning investment in local suppliers or to the supply chain uh, to, uh, to, to pass on technologies and new techniques. Uh, it could take the form of uh, provision of customized services to <coughs> medium-sized firms uh, in return for certain uh, commitments such as employment commitments or, or commitments to be monitored and evaluated. Uh, it could take the form of um, uh, uh, publicly funded but professionally managed uh, venture funds uh, that could invest uh, in a variety of clusters or other uh, areas with clear social and economic objectives. Um, at the top level, uh, it would take, might take the form of a variety of public-private uh, roundtables uh, to un identify and remove uh, specific uh, obstacles uh, to, to the dissemination of uh, High productivity jobs. Now, uh, as I, you hear me go through these examples, I'm sure you'll, you'll be thinking of things that are similar uh, that operate in the real world. So, in fact, none of this is uh, completely uh, alien uh, to actual practices. And um, what uh, I think has been lacking 
uh, is two things. One is to identify the centrality of such an approach to economic policy, to elevate its importance uh, to a level that's commensurate with, let's say, fiscal policy or monetary policy. Uh, and that has been lacked. That's, uh, I think uh, that has lacked because governments have not given um, uh, these, uh, this activity the, 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 the political visibility and prominence that it requires. Um, second uh, is that where they do operate, uh, it's often they don't have a, an explicit employment or high productive job creation uh, 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 dimension explicitly baked into the program. So for example, in the United States where this kind of activity takes place ex extremely well are in DARPA, uh, the um, Defense Department's Advanced Research Projects Initiative. Okay, um, that's sort of a very critical element of US industrial policy where uh, professional managers uh, interact on an ongoing basis with a variety of uh, firms, uh, R&D creators, um, uh, universities around a, a sort of a particular scientific objective. Uh, but the objective is really technological innovation. Um, uh, and very uh, rarely does it take the form of employment creation or the objective of, of good jobs. So the argument here is that, that many of these things that are already, many of these activities that are already taking place are have, to date have neither been sufficiently politically prominent and ambitious, nor have they been adequately focused on uh, what I think is going to be a critical thing going forward, uh, this question of, of where the good jobs are going to come from. Okay. Um, and uh, I'll just end uh, by, by, by mentioning, oops. Uh, what I, I think are, 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 are you know, three critical uh, aspects of, of you know, this way of um, uh, this particular approach to industrial policy uh, or, or, or strategic collaboration between the state and, and the private sector. Uh, and those three are sort of the notion of embeddedness, uh, the, the nation of carrots and sticks, and, and third, you know, the notion of, of accountability. Um, that these, these are things that I've already sort of mentioned in passing, but this is just to, uh, to make clear. Uh, the embeddedness uh, refers to the idea that in fact, um, mu much of the uh, information and knowledge about what needs to be done uh, is not in possession of the state agencies or, or, or state bureaucrats. And what that means is that you cannot build an industrial policy on the East Asian model which presumes you know ex ante, uh, what are the right instruments, what are the right activities to promote. Uh, so for that embeddedness means that um, uh, public agencies have to be in constant collaboration uh, and contact uh, with uh, different elements of the private sector, firms, businesses, uh, SMEs, uh, universities, uh, community colleges, to, to be sort of actually uh, learning about the possibilities. Uh, second, of course, you know, uh, it will be obvious to, to any economist that, that you know, incentives are going to be extremely important. So getting the incentives extremely right. And that typically is going to require a combination of carrots and sticks that, uh, you know, that I was, uh, again, uh, talking in, in, in passing about, that it has to be that the, 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 the firms expect to, be, to, um, to uh, receive public benefits in the forms of, of, of appropriate infrastructure, skills programs, regulatory uh, treatment, uh, but that in return they actually have to provide, they also commit uh, to provide uh, certain objectives that sat satisfy the, 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 social, uh, the social purpose, um, namely in this case it's, it's pro uh, fundamentally uh, creation of, 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 of high wage productive, productive jobs. And third, uh, and, and obviously, but it, it's worth pointing out, uh, pointing it out, uh, that ultimately this has to be uh, embedded uh, in a kind of, of democratic accountability uh, that the intended beneficiaries of such an approach is neither the state agencies themselves nor the businesses. So those, those have to be uh, accountable uh, to society at large. Uh, so I think the, the transparency, uh, the accountability, 
of these processes to, to society at large are going to be, uh, is going to be uh, extremely, extremely important. So I think I've, I've gone back and forth between some sort of very broad principles and also some of the concrete uh, illustrations. There are some references in the slides you can go back to, but I hope uh, it's, it's sort of given you an idea of, of what I meant by this, uh, by this broad social contract. So uh, let me just stop here and we'll turn to Professor Unger. see five major themes in the course. <laughs> uh, four substantive and one methodological. And I will proceed in the inverse direction from the direction that Danny Roger took, placing the discussion of economics at the end. Uh, the first theme is the theme of the failure of the neoliberal and social democratic consensus, which has been the main political economic project in the rich North Atlantic countries for a long time, and which from the North Atlantic world has influenced uh, the whole of humanity. Uh, now, this is a drama in three acts. The first act is the failure of this consensus. Uh, first, it failed because after the initial 30 years subsequent to the Second World War, uh, no strategy of economic growth was developed. And the residual strategy of economic growth became simply the combination of mass consumption with cheap money. The second respect in which it failed is that in the context of the decline of conventional industry, industrial mass production, and the social policies and compromises with which that paradigm of production was associated, economic inequality deepened. And the dominant policies of the state failed to address the needs and interests of the working class majority of these societies. Uh, the third respect in which this consensus failed is that it embarked on a version of globalization that aggravated and accelerated the destruction of the previous social compromises, uh, worsening inequality and exclusion yet further. And the fourth aspect of the failure is that the updating on which the neoliberal social democratic compromise focus, which was the liberalization of conventional social democracy, and especially the liberalization of labor markets, in the end only made things worse. It was supposed to contribute to greater efficiency and greater fairness at the same time. Fairness by overcoming distinctions between insiders and outsiders in the labor market. But even when it was combined with the Dutch or Scandinavian so-called flex security, the provision of endowments and guarantees universally portable and not dependent on a particular job, the practical result was to make economic flexibility a pretext for radical economic insecurity for the majority. Manifest in, among other ways, in the increasing condemnation of 
large parts of the labor force to precarious employment. So in this period, the dominant theme in this liberalized social democracy, social democracy married to neoliberalism, has been the attempt to combine European-style social protection with American-style economic flexibility within a barely adjusted version of the inherited institutional arrangements. Uh, and that marriage has failed to guarantee either economic growth or economic inclusion and a moderation of inequality. So that was the first act of the drama. The second act of the drama is the rise of populism, and especially what we now know as right-wing populism, which is really only the immediate sequel to this first act. It maintains the problem. It jumbles up, it liquefies the political structure and the economic policies. But it has no strong program of its own. The right wing or plutocratic populists may differ from the neoliberal social democratic consensus and their devotion to mercantilism and to restraints on migratory flows. But they have the same negative and defensive attitude to the transformation of production. All they really offer are a set of negative measures to buy a few more years for declining mass production industry. They have no genuine productive strategy. And thus we come to the third chapter in the drama, which is now. And the third chapter in the drama is what comes next. That's the object of the argument in the course. Uh, and this third chapter in the drama has not yet been written. The premise to an understanding of this problem is the impossibility of reestablishing the first step in the drama, the neoliberal and social democratic consensus. It and the forms of production with which it was and remains associated are dead and will not come back. That's the premise. And it's that premise that then creates the transformative opportunity and the demand for ideas. The second theme in the course is the relation of inequality and its moderation to structural change. Uh, the fault in the first theme, that is the, the, the fundamental reason for the failure of the neoliberal and so institutionally conservative social democratic consensus came from the outset. The social democratic compromise, as it was established in the middle of the 20th century, had as its most distinctive trait a retreat from the attempt to reshape the worlds of production and of power. The state was allowed to acquire the power to regulate more intensively, to achieve compensatory and retrospective redistribution, and to manage the economy counter-cyclically. But it abdicated a, a, an ambition of structural change. That was the root of the problem. Now then we come, and this is then the, the heart of the second theme, to the realization that what matters for the moderation of inequality and for the hope of combining an attenuation of inequality with a regeneration of economic growth is not what we can do after the fact through compensatory <coughs> redistribution by tax and transfer, that is to say by progressive taxation and redistributive social entitlement. It is what we can do to change 
the initial or fundamental distribution of advantage, of access to economic and educational opportunities. Compensatory redistribution is entirely secondary to this larger task. And its main usefulness is not to limit inequality, which only structural change can do, but to sustain a high level of investment in people and in their capabilities. Now, this is a hopeful task, and it's a hopeful task because there is an affinity between our stake in economic growth and our stake in the moderation of inequality, enlargement of inclusion. The affinity has to do with the empowerment, the economic empowerment of, the, of, of ordinary men and women. The great tragedy of these societies their moral tragedy, as well as their economic tragedy, is that there's all this intensity of effort, of striving. And much of it goes to waste for lack of opportunities and instruments. And thus, the majority of humanity is belittled, as well as impoverished. The mistake of the liberals and socialists of the 19th century was to believe that there could be a spontaneous convergence, a pre-established harmony between our economic and our moral interests. If only we settled on the right institutional dogma, the right system of rights. There is no such pre-established harmony. But what we can hope for is that there is an area of possible overlap between the institutional conditions for economic progress and the institutional conditions for greater inclusion and equality. And that area of overlap we have to discover and develop experimentally. Now we come to the third theme of the course. The third theme of the course is the primacy of a productivist project. Precisely what social democracy abandoned even at the moment of its foundation. And now the occasion, the opportunity for the formulation of the productivist project is a momentous change in the character of the most advanced practice of production. Mass production declines, and the knowledge economy emerges. But it emerges only in the form of insular vanguards that exclude the vast majority of firms that have workers. So the heart of this productivist project that would give content to the third chapter in the drama is the deepening and dissemination of the knowledge economy beyond the frontiers of these narrow fringes to which it remains confined. And that deepening and dissemination depends on demanding requirements, educational requirements, a different kind of education for the majority, social and moral requirements, the multiplication of forms of collective action and the accumulation of social capital. Because the knowledge economy demands a heightening of reciprocal trust and of discretionary initiative by all participants in the process of production. And a series of cumulative changes in the legal and institutional architecture of the market order. These changes can begin small in the expansion of access to advanced technology and practice and capital, but they end big in a multiplication of the different regimes 
improving the regimes of property and contract that shape access to the resources and opportunities of production. The market economy must cease to be fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself. And these three sets of changes uh, must rely on a cultural and political background. The cultural background is the radicalization of an experimentalist impulse in every department of social life. And the political background is the creation of a high energy democracy that diminishes the dependence of change on crisis and overthrows the rule of the living by the dead. The fourth substantive theme in the course is the theme of other globalization. Just as the market order is not there on a take it or leave it basis, instead of just having more market or less market, we can have a different market, so too globalization is not there on a take it or leave it basis. The question is not just how much globalization, but which globalization. And in this discussion, the fourth theme, the other globalization, three ideas have been paramount. The first idea has been that the now established direction of globalization does impose constraints and ultimately unacceptable constraints. But even within those constraints, there is a large room for maneuver. Depending on, we on whether a country arms itself with the instruments of rebellion, such as a high level of domestic saving, the fiscal shield of rebellion, or a high level of costly reserves, so that it can dissent and open its own way. The second idea is that the constraints of the established form of globalization must ultimately be faced. And the single most important feature of the other globalization that we would need is that it be characterized by what I call an institutional minimalism. That it not exact from countries, for example, in, for their participation in the world trading system, that as a condition of their participation, they subscribe not just to a market economy, but to a very particular version of a market economy. One that, for example, under the label subsidies, outlaws the forms of strategic coordination between governments and firms that the countries that are now rich use to enrich themselves. Then it open and maintain the space for experimentation about the arrangements of the market order. And the third idea is that the redirection of globalization has to begin down below in strong national projects. It will not be the gift of an enlightened cosmopolitan elite. Strong national projects are projects that mobilize on large scale the physical, economic, financial, and human resources of a country tapping the energy and the talents of a larger number of people that embody the, the, the path, the national path, in distinctive institutional arrangements. And that condition engagement in the world economy on the, on the interests of this national project and its further development. Uh, and our proposals in, these in this course, Danny's and mine, I understand to represent a subset of these strong national projects. A subset marked by the defining concern with the relation between growth and inclusion or growth and empowerment. Uh, now I come to the fifth theme in the course. And this is the area in which, as you have seen, uh, we most disagree. Uh, 
Daniel 9. Uh, and that's the theme of economics. <laughs> now let me go in steps. <coughs> so the first step is the basic picture of the relation of the contemporary forms of social and historical study to the understanding of structure, of structural discontinuity, structural change, and structural alternatives. Change in the institutional arrangements and ideological assumptions that shape the surface routines and conflicts of social life. Structure is the supreme object of both theoretical and practical ambition in society. To uphold the structure or to change it is the focus of, of ambitious activity. Now, classical European social theory, especially Marxism, had a view of structure. The structures are artifacts. We made them. And they now present themselves to us as if they were an alien thing. But this discovery that the structures are artifacts which we can understand because we made them and that we can reshape because they're not the way things naturally are was surrounded in classical social theory and in Marxism by a series of deterministic illusions. That there's a closed menu in history of alternative regimes feudalism, capitalism, socialism, that each of them is an indivisible system so that therefore politics is either always the revolutionary substitution of one regime by another or the reformist management of a regime. And that there are historical laws governing the foreordained succession of these regimes in history. Uh, and all of these illusions have become literally incredible. So that the devotees of these theoretical traditions continue to lose, use their vocabulary without really believing in their heroic assumptions. Now, on the other hand, then, there are the contemporary social sciences. And each of them, in its own way, including the best organized and most influential economics, has suppressed structural insight and severed the vital link between the understanding of the actual and the imagination of the adjacent possible. What can happen next? And the result is that they descend into different forms of retrospective rationalization. Because to understand the phenomenon is just to understand what it can become under certain provocations or interventions. That's the background to the problem in which the high academic culture, rather than being part of the solution, has become part of the problem and denies us the instruments of structural insight. Uh, now I come to the second element in this narrative, the evolution of economics in the 20th century and since the marginalist turn at the end of the 19th century that has defined the main agenda of what we now call economics. So it was a very particular way of understanding the economy, about which I'll speak next. A series of connected markets viewed through the prism of relative prices, comparative and competitive selection under the constraint of scarcity. 
Then K comes K with his with his incomplete heresy uh, and with his desire to influence and to shine, his his worldliness, his equivocation, uh, and uh, he produces this view which is caught somewhere in between the a theory of a general theory of economic breakdowns or slumps and being just a theory of a particular kind of slump. Between being uh, a, a theory of persistent disequilibrium in the economy and being a theory of a low level of equilibrium, equilibrium at a low level of employment. That was the first stage. Then one year after Keynes publishes his main theoretical work, uh, a disciple of his, John Hicks, and others after him, reduces this view to a series of handy formulas. The ISLM charts that ever since have frequented the textbooks in which students all over the world study economics. Extirpating all of the shadows and contradictions and the larger interests in the already equivocal system. Then comes a third step. The Americans, led by Paul Samuelson and his generation, redefine this formulaic Keynesianism, downsize, as a theory of monetary and fiscal policy. And they call that macroeconomics. And they superimpose this macroeconomics on the untransformed body of the economics inherited from marginalism, which they then label microeconomics. So what had begun as a rivalry between two intellectual systems, two ways of thinking, ends as two parts of the same textbook, as if they were be two complementary parts of the same system. Then follows the fourth step. Once the apostasy had been reduced and domesticated in this way, it begins to be undermined. Under work that goes under various labels, like the micro foundations of macroeconomics, designed to show that everything that was new in those ideas was false. And that everything that was true in those ideas could already be inferred from the previous microeconomics. The fourth chapter in the story was foretold in the first, in Keynes's equivocation. In politics, we must often compromise. But in the context of comprehensive ideas, we must wage relentless war until the unconditional surrender or annihilation of the enemy. Uh, and that little story told there is half, of, uh, is half of the story, half of the history of economics over the last hundred years. Uh, now I come to the third element, to focus on the, 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 the core of the marginalist economics and of what makes it unsatisfactory as a guide in our intellectual program and in our practical projects. And to this end, I'm going to focus, as Dan did, on just the first of my four criticisms, the one which was in dispute. Uh, the relation between analysis and empirical. 
and the question of whether there are causal laws in economics. Now, here's a simple taxonomy. So first, there is logical inference masquerading as causal explanation. The Austrian economists, who were the most intransigent defenders of marginalism in its earlier period, understood very clearly that the essential move in this marginalist system was to establish a complete equivalent between economic analysis and deductive logic. So take the example which Danny gave of the effect of minimum wage legislation on employment under either competitive equilibrium or monopsony. The economist analyzes the relation between prices and quantities, between marginal revenue per worker and marginal cost of labor. And the results that he describes follow automatically. They follow from the axiom. They are the result of deductive inference from the axiom. It's all logical deduction when it's pure. Now, that's not what causal explanation is like in any empirical science. We give you the example of a canonical form of causal explanation. In the gold standard of natural science, which has been fundamental physics, Newton's inverse square law. The gravitational force among bodies varies in direct proportion to their inertial masses and in inverse proportion to the square of the distance between them. Astonishing. When Newton was asked, what's the reason for the inverse square law, he was dumbfounded. Reason? He had a preternatural intuition and insight into the workings of nature. Now, it's possible to make sense of this remarkable symmetry using, for example, Descartes' algebraic geometry. Imagine a body orbiting around the sun and a set of flux lines representing the gravitational force emanating out from the sun to this body in orbit. And suppose that the number of these flux lines remains constant. The distance between the flux lines as you go further out into space will become greater. And that will be a geometrical representation of this weakening of the gravitational force in the areas defined by the, by the flux lines. So the gravitational force will then diminish on the basis of one over the distance squared. In a world which is like a machine and in which forces interact with one another in Euclidean space. But there's nothing here that can be deduced from axioms. And that's what causal explanation is like. It's like, for example, in Darwin's explanation of a radically different kind. It has nothing to do with deductive or axiomatic reasoning. Now, why does the difference between these two kinds of inference or explanation matter? 
it matters for two main reasons. The first reason is that to understand how something works, you have to have this transformative insight. You have to see how, how it changes under what conditions. And you can't do that through deductive inference from axioms. You have to have a causal picture and a causal view. And the second reason why it matters is that unless you have such a substantive view, your theory can never be overthrown. And if it can't be overthrown, it's no good. So an accumulation of contrary facts, like the perihelion procession of Mercury, can eventually lead to the overturning of Newtonian mechanics. But nothing could ever lead to the overturning of this quasi-logical marginalist economics, because it was never a causal picture of science in the first place. It's a way of thinking clearly and logically by deductive interest. It could go on for a thousand years. And it would die not with a bang, but with a whimper. Because people would eventually think they was worth less of their time. Not because it would be contradicted by empirical observations. Now, so here's the problem. So this science, this <laughs> quasi-logical science has its use. It's useful. It's useful. Uh, it's useful because it presents the bill. It's a science of trade-offs and constraints. So let me give you an example from the present American reality. So now the right and the left in the United States have decided to gang up on the pharmaceutical companies and on biotech industry. And the market capitalization of the biotech companies is now at a 25 year, old, 25 year low because of this political agitation. So uh, you can say there are three ways to manage biotechnical and pharmaceutical innovation. You can say well, there'll be nine drug trials. Nine of them will fail the tenth will succeed. Then you have to make a killing on the tenth. Otherwise, the system is unsustainable. That's one way of doing it. The second way of doing it is the state pays. And the third way of doing it is you treat the businesses as common carriers or regulated utilities with administered prices and regulated profit making. Or you have some combination of these. But what you can't do is to say, we won't accept the second or third solution, but we'll start to undermine the first solution. That's not going to work. Now, there's a twist. The twist is that Donald Trump is right, and the whole world is parasitic on the system of pharmaceutical innovation headquartered in the United States. So the Americans subsidize, directly and indirectly, the system in the rest of the world. And it's untenable. So now we have the economist trained in this useful, somber method presenting the bill. And he comes with his calculator. He took economics 101. Uh, uh, he doesn't have to be like Newton and have a preternatural intuition about anything. Uh, all he has to do is be good at logic games and smarter than the kid next to him. Uh, and he comes with his calculator, and he says to the Americans, uh, look, this is not about ideology. This is about arithmetic. This isn't going to work. Uh, and that would be a very useful exercise. And it's amazing that common sense, which, according to Descartes, is the resource most widely distributed in the world, seems to be so absent from this national debate in the United States. Uh, so that is the undisputed usefulness 
of this discipline that is to serve this function. Now suppose we begin to escalate the discussion. And we say we want to change the system. To redesign the relation between the state and the firm and to organize innovation on a different basis. And to do that, we need to understand the deep workings of the knowledge economy in all of its versions, including the version it has in this, uh, in this, in this biotech industry, to understand how it works and how it can be made to work. And if we turn to this man with the calculator, he's going to get very upset. <laughs> His eyes will glaze over. His head will swim. He'll say goodbye. Uh, uh, and and it, there's, there, it's not that he, what he has to offer will be completely useless. It says usefulness will be very limited. And we're going to have to embark on something else, on a different way of understanding. Focus on structure and structural alternatives. And then logical inference from axioms will not be enough. Now, I said in my, that I would give a taxonomy of the law in this kind of economics. Logical inference masquerading as causal explanation is only one type. Now, here's a second type. A second type are loose and inconstant empirical generalizations. Danny gave an example. Exposure to world trade may increase the activity of the state, the compensatory activity of the state to secure against risk, to develop social insurance, and so forth. It may or it may not. Often, exposure to world trade in different moments in the previous history of globalization has been used deliberately as a way to savage the internal social compromise. It all depends on the institutional and ideological background. So these aren't laws either. And we do need a way of thinking about the relation between the economic phenomena and the structural background. Now, there's a third kind of law. And this would be the genuine law. The most plausible candidate for a real law in the study of economic phenomena is what Robert Solow called the good old law of declining marginal returns. Now, here's something really interesting. This economics since marginalists has nothing to say about that law. They refer to it constantly. But unlike the previous economics that came back before marginalism, they make not even an attempt to elucidate it. And the reason is that it can't be understood or represented in the language of this marginalist economics. It requires some understanding of structure and of innovation in relation to structure, and of whether, for example, innovation is continuous or discontinuous, episodic or perpetual, external to the production system or internal to it, all topics which escape this way of thinking. So we need the ideas, and we don't have them or we have them in fragmentary form. There's no pretext to be confused. So the impulse to logical clarity remains. But it is no surrogate for the understanding of transformation and transformative possibility. And for that, we need intellectual revolution. Uh, now, as I look back on our arguments in the course, uh, it seems to me that the, 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 the two, two marriages, which have been our, our, our main objects here, the sources of, of the targets of aspiration, uh, 
The first is the marriage of imagination to production. That's what would come next in the economic history of mankind. And that's what a deepened and disseminated form of the knowledge economy would represent. And our reward would be to find freedom not just from the economy through the overcoming of scarcity, but in the economy. But to, to work toward that marriage, to understand it, to develop the ideas that it requires, we need a second marriage. And the second marriage is the combination of the visionary impulse with technical expertise and rigor. A combination that seems to be both necessary and impossible and is required for the achievement of the first marriage. The celebration of these two marriages in the unlikely and inauspicious setting of a classroom at Harvard University has been the overriding aim of our efforts. Certainly, the Newtonian laws of gravitation and laws of attraction are not uh, causal explanations precisely for uh, the way that, in the way that you put it, they are um, physical laws. They're laws uh, underlying causal explanations. They're laws of that. You can build, you yeah. can take that as a yeah. axiom and then build causal inference from that. But that in itself, as you said, is not something that's you know, a, a, a causal inference. And I, I think that underlines a, a, a significant difference between uh, physical sciences and social sciences, uh, which goes back to one of the points you made earlier, which is that in physics, or at least in Newtonian physics, there are, um, uh, you know, there's a physical world that's constant and unchanging with its own laws that can be uh, formulated in mathematical terms. The social world does not have any constant precisely because the social world is a construction by human beings. Um, and therefore, we cannot have any construction, uh, any laws of that, of the same, of the same, of the same character. I, I think it seems to me that, that you know, your analogy falls, you know, it, it pray for very different reasons to me. I mean, the, the central difficulty that the, the marginalists had in, 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 in conceptualizing what economics was in terms of sort of, you know, in analogy to Newtonian physics. And I think that analogy has failed completely, although for different reasons than, than the ones um, uh, in, 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 your, in your comments. Um, and I think it fails because, you know, that because the social world is man-made, human-made, uh, it's infinitely malleable. Because it's infinitely malleable, uh, everything, every result in the social world is necessarily contextual uh, and contingent. And therefore, the best that you can do in social sciences is to articulate contingent 
generalizations and what the role of economic theory or what economic models is, is to make clear not just the axiomatic basis of, basis of those inferences, but everything else that goes into it, because it's not just axioms, it's also uh, assumptions <coughs> about behavior, it's assumptions about institutional context, uh, it's assumptions about the nature of the market. Um, and, and that actually allows you, gives you a sort of a, 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 a rich menu of being able to do precisely the kind of, 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 of uh, analyses that you said economics cannot do, which is to look at the consequences of alternatives. Uh, because by modifying, not the axioms themselves, although you could do that too, uh, but modifying your assumptions about which markets exist, which don't, what the institutional uh, setting is, what the laws and regulations are, uh, the cultural predispositions, uh, by varying those things, you can derive alternative causal inferences about what the consequences of changing certain uh, key assumptions, behavioral or parametric, uh, on, on consequences are. So uh, to, to take this um, to our substantive discussion where we actually agree, and I think this is probably what I would like everybody to, to take on, uh, uh, is that this focus on productivist solutions to, to inclusion and economic growth. Um, I wouldn't know how to think about the menu of uh, institutional approaches to uh, inclusive institutions, in what I call the social contract and the productivist uh, um, uh, domain. I wouldn't know how to think about those things without using various building blocks from contemporary economics, such as agency theory, such as theory of coordination failures, such as the theory of uh, second best, such as the theories of externalities, and such as also without losing contemporary empirical metric of evaluation when we start thinking about how we're going to revise, monitor, and evaluate, and change what we believe in light of new evidence. So, uh, so those are all sort of you know, I think the, the extremely important um, tools uh, about thinking thinking about conceptualizing the alternatives, and second, in terms of putting those alternatives in, 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 into, into effect and seeing what the consequences are, so you can do the next step, which is to, to monitor uh, and, and, and to revise. But just, um, just, and just to hang on this, I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting you bring up the diminishing you know, marginal <laughs> product as an example of a law, which is actually you know, the pure logical inference from another economics construct, which is the, the assumption of constant returns to scale. It's just exactly the opposite of what you said. Um, so, yeah. uh, but that's, let that not detain us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, I, I think we had a, a, a you know, it, this course would have been very boring uh, um, if we had agreed on everything. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that you agree that economics is useful. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'd like to leave the economics discussion here. I will, I will content myself with that conclusion yeah. and leave the rest of the discussion for the following years. But I, I do want to, you know, sort of go back to and very briefly to, to highlight uh, in, in terms of your comments, and I think that's where there was a significant overlap with what I said on this this focus on this productivist approach, which I think is really, uh, you know, the critical new frontier. So just a few very brief comments. So first of all, it should be clear in this discussion about economics, we're using this term economics, but it's one economics. It's a particular dominant tradition, a theoretical paradigm. It has a history. It was produced at a certain moment. And it, uh, we diminish ourselves if we say, well, there could be this revolution 120 years ago. And what about us? Can't we make another revolution? So it's, 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 a, it's, it's a very particular intellectual history that's given a shape to this. Uh, second point to say in this, about these structures in society. So it's true, we made them. And they are in principle mutable. But the extent to which they are mutable varies radically in history. And our interest actually is to make them more mutable. Because for the most part, they're just there. 
as if they were part of the furniture of the universe. And that's the problem. Uh, so this whole idea of a transformative project depends on a transformation of the kinds of structures that there are so that they make themselves available to revision without requiring crisis to be the condition of their transformation. Uh, now, just third on the specificity of this form of economics, you've emphasized correctly the model building element. So, and that's how it, it, it changes. So, a model doesn't work, you make another model. You change the elements of the model. You change the values given to the elements. But the underlying way of thinking doesn't change. Because that was the point. They discovered a way in this particular moment of intellectual history to, to, to model competitive selection under conditions of scarcity through relative prices in the form of an axiomatic system. And that led to this particular intellectual tradition. It doesn't have to be that way. That, that's, that's an intellectual choice that was made at a certain moment in, in history that has certain advantages and disadvantages. It contributes immensely to logical clarity, but it's, it's, it's a burden, it's an incubus on us if what we want is structural insight. And uh, so we have to put it in its place uh, and, uh, and, and continue the work of, of intellectual revolution and aspiration in the service of the empowerment of humanity. That's what we want. We want a world in which we can become more human by becoming more godlike and live in such a way, and live in such a way that we die and we want. I'm enormously grateful.